Good morning. I'm Maurice Crespi, managing partner of Schindler's Attorneys. Schindler's Attorneys are a co-founder of Cobra. Cobra was founded um, together with IQ Business and Engaged Business Turnaround. And the idea behind Cobra is to have as many businesses, companies join Cobra uh, with a view to assisting in their respective professions on a pro bono basis uh, where required. So if you're a business in distress and you need any help whatsoever, Cobra is geared to provide that help. And it does so through <clears throat> various things. It's webinars such as today's, uh, uh, knowledge base, which has been put together by Safiso, one of our guest speakers today, uh, which has, we, we, we are reliably told is the most uh, uh, comprehensive in South Africa. Um, we host private Zoom meetings uh, with you, your team, uh, your employees, um, where we can talk them through the principles, the law. Um, and uh, if you require assistance, for instance, mediating with creditors or your employees, uh, we do that. Again, we do that on a pro bono basis where required. So as I said, part of our offering are these webinars. Um, today's webinar is uh, brought to us by both Safisa and uh, Rob Urquhart. Um, and the topic today is the future of job readiness, skills development, as well as skills development pathways for young entrepreneurs. So Rob will be talking about that um, together with Safisa. Uh, Rob is the Executive for Knowledge and Research at Harambi Youth Employment Accelerator. Harambi is a not-for-profit social enterprise with extensive experience building solutions and innovations that can solve the youth unemployment challenges at scale. Harambi does this by partnering with business, government, young people, and many others who are committed to results that can work. Harambi uses research to develop insights and drive innovations that can more effectively transition young people into jobs and address the glo global challenge of youth unemployment. Rob works with teams inside and outside of Harambi to build and communicate an evidence base for what is needed to solve youth unemployment at scale. Drawing on over 1.5 million data elements that uh, Harambi has collected through its engagement and support of over 650,000 youth and the facilitation of 160,000 jobs and work experiences. Rob works with local and global academic and research institutions to develop knowledge and insights for policy, interventions and practices that address youth unemployment in South Africa and the world. So we're very, very privileged to have Rob today. Thank you, Rob, for joining us. And Safiso, Safiso, he's a regular on the show. He's absolutely fantastic. Uh, he's uh, insightful. He's the, the lead of internal research and thought leadership team at IQ Business. He has 11 years industry experience, and uh, he heads up the team that put together the knowledge base on the Cobra website. That website's www.cobra.org.za, or you can just send us an email and uh, we'll immediately respond, info at cobra.org.za. Um, uh, uh, so before I... Uh, hand over to Rob. Let me introduce the remaining panelists. We have Emma Marseille from IQ Business, uh, Rene Klopper from IQ Business, and Gary Barachovitz from uh, Schindler's Attorneys. So thanks again, Rob. Over to you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Maurice, and um, thank you for having me uh, on, your, on your show this morning as it is. I thought I'd just start by just kind of talking about uh, this concept of, of workforce readiness um, and just locating it in a, in a bit of context. And it may seem fairly obvious, but uh, the, there's been a lot of talk about the fourth industrial revolution. And really when we start to think about uh, what uh, workforce uh, readiness and job readiness looks like for for young people in particular, we have to understand it in, in, um, in that context. And we know, I mean, we know that the fourth industrial revolution is here and that it is impacting uh, our work in, in multiple ways. And certainly we know that there's a whole new set of hard skills or technical skills that are, um, that are being associated with, with the arrival of, of 4IR. But equally, we should not ignore the fact that um, 
they come with a set of needs for soft skills as well. So in as much as you can see the rise for the demand in, in <coughs> data, science, uh, data scientists, for example, or software developers, there's equally a demand for that to be accompanied by soft skills that are needed for work, um, such as teamwork uh, and collaboration. And so I wanted to just make that as a sort of a passing framing statement. And then also to, to add on that the way in which companies um, are reacting to the fourth industrial revolution is often to, when they're thinking about reskilling or upskilling, that's often directed to um, their most valuable resources. And so there's potentially, uh, we run the risk of this, uh, of increasing a divide, if you like, between those who are skilled and those who are unskilled. So that's just a, a sort of first passing statement I want, to, I want to make. And just building off of that, perhaps a second passing statement is, is, so what does that mean in terms of how we need to think about um, this idea of, of job readiness or workforce readiness for, for young people and entrepreneurs? Um, and I think they're, they're kind of three, they're four, they're four things that we really need to think about. The, the first is, we've got to think about those who um, are about to enter into the workforce versus those, the needs of those who are in the workforce. And so that's about thinking about how do you reskill those already in jobs versus those um, who may have gaps and about to enter the, the workforce. And that really has sort of three sort of time dimensions to it. And when we, when we start to think about this question, the first is the short term dimension. And that's the dimension of how do we um, address priority skills that are needed and, and, and how can we do that um, in the short term in the fastest way possible? So there's an element of, of, uh, of urgency and agility that is needed to, to react. The second is a sort of a medium term consideration, which is really about thinking about how do we transform um, the skilling system uh, in, um, in, uh, in a way to be more agile. Uh, and respond to what is likely to be continuing to be a, a series of change, uh, an ongoing experience of change that the fourth industrial revolution brings. And then the sort of third element is we have to think about this from a long-term perspective and actually how do we um, build a workforce that is, um, that is, is and build a system um, that is fit for the future of work and, and responds um, appropriately. And, and so that's the, the this idea of the fourth industrial revolution is this one kind of context in which to think about it. But you can also understand that in our absolute immediate context, this context, this has been, uh, there's this, this layer that's come into this around what the impact of the COVID-19 virus is. And so as a framing statement, I'd like to, I'd like to just make, make that statement before moving on to, to really the sort of five responses that we think um, are necessary uh, to to address these issues of, of, of work readiness and work readiness for entrepreneurs. The first is we have to think about job readiness and work readiness um, um, in the sense that it has to start becoming more demand driven. And by demand driven, I mean, it's got to respond to, this is not training for training's sake. We've had years and years of training was just being done for training's sake. And in fact, Andrew Donaldson from National Treasury three years ago had done an analysis that says, suggests that South Africa spends 200 billion rand a year between the private and the public sector on education. And yet we have this youth unemployment crisis that we have. So th this concept of driving uh, workforce readiness to be more demand driven is really, really critical. And that is, that is a number of dimensions to it. I think it, number one, it has a dimension of, we've got to understand where the opportunities are in the economy. And yes, there's a lot of talk about an L-shaped recovery of economic recovery for South Africa. And there's a lot of talk about, um, about what and how badly un unemployment is going, to, is going to rise. But equally, there's the work that COBRA has been doing and others that have been doing is thinking about what does recovery kind of look like and which sectors are um, going to be winners and which sectors are going to be losers, because there are going to be some sectors that are winners and losers. Um, and certainly we can see that in, in hospitality as, as being the most, one of the most significantly impacted sectors. But, but other sectors, for example, stand the potential to, uh, to benefit. So certainly having listened to um, a conversation a couple of weeks ago, um, those industries and sectors associated with food security, where South Africa is uh, relatively secure in its own value chains of, of food production, um, are feeling quite bullish about uh, the, the prospects um, going, going forward. So 
there's this need to kind of look at where the opportunities are and within those sectors, what those opportunities um, look like um, and focus on those areas where we can expect to see, um, can expect to see, to see uh, demand grow. So there's that aspect of uh, the other sector, obviously, I think is to, to mention is the, um, the global business services, globally traded services or business process outsourcing as it's known. South Africa is very, very competitive um, in this space. And the, um, the upside of a, of a downgrade and a weakened currency is that we are incredibly um, attractive to offshoring those types of, of services. And I think I, I stand corrected, but I think we are probably um, ranked third most attractive destination in the world at the moment for those services. And so certainly prior to, to COVID and even during COVID, um, the PESA, the, the industry body for, for globally traded services, um, is very bullish about the prospects um, for, for job growth there. And those are sectors that have the potential to um, absorb young people. So there's, there's that, that's an aspect of, of demand driven. Um, being demand driven, however, is also, is also just thinking about the, what the skills, really thinking and really grappling with what the skills and capabilities um, are required for growth. And so often when we think about workforce readiness, um, the reaction is to say, well, let's just pump money into functional skills training, when really that um, is only a one aspect of what builds someone in one's employability and workforce readiness. And I mean, we've learned this through working with um, over 500 employers in South Africa and, um, and beyond. But um, workforce readiness is actually holistic. It has a number of different features to it. Um, it has aspects, what we would call soft skills, um, which are things like the socialization for work. Um, uh, are you ready to work in the environment? Do you know what the environment is that you're going to work in? Um, do you have the competencies and the, the skill, the, the, the soft skills to be able to work in that environment? So for example, teamwork and collaboration. Um, and do you have the attributes that are required for work? And that's simple things that we would take for granted but young people, um, particularly those from excluded backgrounds, don't necessarily know and understand. Things like punctuality, um, punctuality, attendance, having an inquiring mind, a positive attitude, I, those are all, all vitally important. And so just to illustrate this and make it a bit richer, I'm, I'll share with you an example of, of how we've understood this, uh, this dynamic. And it comes from work that we've done for butchers, actually. So apologies to anyone who's a vegetarian and listening to this. Um, but we, believe it or not, there, is, there has been a shortage of butchers in, um, in South Africa. And some of that shortage is driven by the fact that to become proficient at a butcher, you've really got to, you've really got to work at carving up meat carcasses and, and practice on that. And it's expensive because in doing so, um, you're practicing and that meat often isn't, um, isn't, isn't very resellable. And so we were trying to help this industry understand um, how, they could, uh, how they could get young people into those opportunities and why they were struggling to get young people into those opportunities. And so we kind of looked at what makes a good butcher. And these are the dimensions that make a good butcher. And, and uh, this, is, this, is, this is stuff we've done. This is, I'm not making this stuff up. The first is you don't need maths to be a good butcher. Um, and there's this obsession in the, 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 uh, the workforce about maths and science. And, and I think people use those things to filter out and try and identify talent. But you actually don't need maths to be a good butcher. What you need is the ability to measure something and the ability to weigh something. And with instruments today, that can actually very, very easily be taught in a very short space of time. Then um, you actually need to be more of an introvert rather than an extrovert. So it's... Um, when we looked at people, we found that successful, successful butchers were actually more of the introvert type. And why is that? Well, because if you're an extrovert, you are more likely to be spending your time um, chatting to the people around you and probably run more of a risk of, of lopping off your hand in the, in the bandsaw. And then the sort of third dimension that you need that makes a good butcher is... Um, is actually manual dexterity, um, being good with your hands. And so how can you find a proxy for someone who um, is, uh, is good at that stuff is to 
think about what other things they may do with their hands. So does someone play a guitar, for example, or do they do beadwork or do they craft or do they tinker around with uh, fixing things, for example. And so just a very simple example to show that when we think about work readiness and what work readiness and what being demand driven leads, uh, means we've got to we've got to actually get to grips with some of the granularity of what that um, what that requires. Um, <clears throat> having said that, I mean I think we also have to face the the economic reality that um, we're, even with our, our pre-COVID kind of growth curve um, GDP growth rates, that it's be highly unlikely that the South African economy will create enough jobs to to absorb young people, even under the most um, optimistic um, growth rates when we look at the number of youth entering into the labor force um, every year. And so some of, some of the, what are the alternatives then? And, and um, you know, one of the things that I think we, we believe is that we've got, really got to look at the informal economy um, in South Africa, which is relative to South Africa, relative to the rest of Africa is, is significantly underdeveloped and understand what the opportunities um, for young people in the informal economy look like. And this is where I think the entrepreneurial um, piece that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about is, is coming into. Um, and so if we bring these, these concepts together, this idea of being demand driven and having soft skills, um, we've then got to think about, well, what are the soft skills that make, uh, would make, a, would a, that make a good entrepreneur um, and build um, entrepreneur and would build entrepreneurship in an informal economy type of ses setting in the future. So that's, that would be things like uh, self-sufficiency, resilience, um, self-management, all kind of concepts that, um, that are needed uh, to do that, that type of work. And, and, uh, and then there, there's, there's, there's the need, there's the, the requirements of, to think about how do you build out those solutions to, to, to get those skills um, embedded in young people. So being demand driven is like the first thing that I think is a, is a change that we've seen as being needed to, to think about a job and workforce readiness. The second thing is um, there's, there's got to be line of sight. Um, there's got to be line of sight in, in respect of, of the training and workforce readiness that we do. Um, you can't, we can't afford to have these programs that go on for years and years and years and costs and costs enormous amounts of money and yet don't uh, ready young people for work. So for example, it costs around 834,000 Rand to produce one toolmaker artisan in South Africa coming through our TVET system. That's an enormous amount of money. And you can understand when you put a price, uh, a price tag onto that, why we do have a shortage of artisans in the economy when it becomes so expensive to train um, and we don't see the throughput rates from TVET colleges for those types of um, opportunities. So this idea of what is just in time training? What is the amount of training that can get you ready for work in the shortest time possible? Um, and I'll use another example to, to, to illustrate this. It goes back to my previous comment about mathematics. So we had worked, uh, done some work with a, a hotel a hospitality group in, in South Africa who had come to us and said, look, we have a, we have a shortage of dealers, not, not drug dealers, but dealers, dealers on casino floors. Can you help us think about um, how we can address this kind of problem? And we ran a diagnostic with them and what we saw was that um, right at the beginning of the process of, of hiring was a requirement that uh, any applicant had to complete a test in which um, mathematics was, uh, was tested. And this was a massive stumbling point. We saw that sort of 70, 70 people, 70% 70 of people who were um, applying for these positions were not passing this assessment. And so we agreed with the hospitality group that we would take this assessment and we went to the University of Johannesburg and the University of the Verwaltsrand to their mathematics department and basically deconstructed what that assessment looked like to try and understand the points, the point at which, um, at which young people were not passing, um, were, were stumbling and not passing the assessment. And it actually came down to the critical elements that um, they were not passing and that was critical for dealers was this concept of multiplicative reasoning, this idea of we we might remember it as brackets of division, multiplication, um, addition, subtraction, bod mass or bad mass, um, if you like. 
And so we were able to work with that hospitality group to put in place a very short program um, of about five weeks in length um, using Khan Academy to really drive and reinforce this aspect, this particular aspect um, of, of mathematics that was needed and get young people ready to, to, um, to, to, to take these assessments again. And once we'd done that, we actually saw some really good success rates. We saw this failure rate flip on its head from sort of a 70% fail rate to actually a 70% pass rate. And I use that example because in five weeks, you can actually get someone ready for, ready for work by really understanding what kind of the gaps are, um, are needed. So this idea of, of just-in-time um, just line of sight training is, 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 is critical. The third point I want to make is that um, we've got to look at this, uh, this idea, we've got to embrace this idea of, of open learning systems. And, and we, would, we would understand it as um, massively, online, massively open online universities, MOOCs or MOOCs as they are called. Um, but really that as a vehicle um, to democratize and make accessible um, readiness programs for young people is critical. The fourth point and attached to that um, is, is micro-credentialing. Micro so um, it's fine to go online and to do a course, um, but if that course doesn't have any credibility um, outside of, outside of the, the, the system that you're doing it, um, then you have to question whether it's, it's really worthwhile. So there's got to be credibility attached to it. Employers have to see the value, um, have to see the value of that, that, uh, that micro-credential. It's also got to stack. So, um, you know, you've got to be able to build on it to build something that is a more complete, um, a complete, uh, a complete whole. And, you know, we can see, for example, in, in New Zealand, um, New Zealand have worked with, uh, um, um, have developed a program for, a self-driving car engineering nano degree. Um, and they have partnered with Udacity, which is a massively open online university, uh, together with BMW, Mercedes-Benz, um, McLaren, and NVIDIA, the, the uh, chip company, um, to create this uh, and endorse this, um, endorse this kind of course. And I think that's a really good example because it's a collaboration between um, a platform, um, uh, in this case, Udacity, and uh, a whole bunch of employers, leading employers in the sector, Mercedes, BMW, et cetera, um, to create something that um, has, has value um, for them and would have value for a participant um, in completing that. So micro-credentials micro um, um, have to have weight, they have to stack, and they have to have meaning um, in the marketplace um, um, to, for, for this to succeed. And then I think the last point to make is, um, so this is my sort of fifth requirement as we, we think about workforce readiness in the future, is um, we've actually got to change the way in which we think about and fund um, skilling in South Africa. And so, I, I, I mean, I, I make the point again about a 200 billion private public sector spend on, on education and training, post-skilling education and training. Um, and, and not seeing the results for that. So how can we, how can we shift the principle on which, um, on which training is done? Not doing training for training's sake, but actually doing training for training outcome, to, to have a real out, kind of outcome. Um, and this, I think this idea of pay for performance is something that we've, we've embraced, that, that um, investments in workforce readiness um, should be tied to a tangible outcome, not the achievement of a degree or um, a certificate, but actually in, the, in our case, the pla a placement into work or the uh, an ability to, to um, acquire some work. Um, and there's some really kind of good examples of, of, um, of organizations that are doing this in South Africa. We Think Code is one, the French, they're a French coding company, um, there are no barriers. Anyone can take their, their assessment online, whether you're in school, out of school, 65, 18. Um, and they've been working really hard to apply this idea of being able to secure 
um, funding for their programs and that, that provision of funding for their skilling program is based on the successful placements of their graduates into opportunities um, um, when they finish. And so, Sophia, so I've and and um, and all I have uh, I've rambled a bit, but uh, those were some opening remarks. It'd be great to hear some comments and responses. I was hoping Sophia would jump in. Uh, we do have a comment here. Yeah. Um, before we get to Sophia. Um, I often feel like those soft skills are far more important than the technical ones. It really gives young people the opportunity to start on a more level playing field in the world of work. That's so interesting. Introverted butchers. So, Fisa, you heard what uh, Rob had to say. Comments? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, the, the number of, uh, I guess, approaches that uh, I'll, 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 I'll I'll add into uh, some of the insights that Rob has, has brought to the table. And I think the first one that starts with the, you know, the demand side and, and matching the supply and demand of skills in the, you know, in the marketplace. And, and you know, we've historically spoken, for example, around how, how Germany has successfully done that in an economy that employs more than 50% in the, uh, vocational um, and 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 in essence hands driven um, technical uh, economic marketplace and I have lamented before that one of the things that they did really well was to put that portion of the education cluster under the economic cluster and and therefore I think it answers to to rob 's um, suggestion again around this paid for, uh, paid for performance is that the direction in which you want your economy to grow has got to be directly related to the investment that you're making in your educational outcomes and in your educational programs, et cetera. And so in a South African context, um, if we are seeing, for example, that we, are, we, we need to reinvest um, in primary sectors um, for us to inform our industrial policy, um, and therefore, because you can't talk around reindustrializing when you don't have the inputs. And these are some of the challenges that we've found in the South African economy is that our import intensity has been accelerating over the years, uh, primarily because our primary capacity has declined and our manufacturing capacity has declined. And so you, you just don't uh, industrialize on a base where you still need to import portions of your inputs. And so we now make an example and say so horticulture has been a growth sector from an agricultural point of view. Um, we're the leading exporter in many horticultural products, avocado, um, deciduous fruits, um, macadamia nuts, and we can go on, right? And so those are growth sectors in South Africa. But what have you seen in terms of investment in agricultural colleges? What have you seen as an investment uh, towards, for example, water security in South Africa? Well, you know, if you look at Israel, 2008, they were water scarce. They were actually drought stricken. And today they are water abundant. They don't know what to do with their water. And uh, one of the things they did really well was invest in research and development. Um, over those 10 years, their proportion of their GDP that went to R&D was averaging above 5%. Ours is currently below 1%. It's about 0.8% that we're investing in R&D. It's the uh, variable called GERD um, in South Africa. And we targeting 1.5%, but the point is we're not. And so even in the sectors where we've got a comparative advantage globally, we're not making the right um, skills-based investments. And so um, up until we understand how the, the structure of the economy matches up with our planning from a skills point of view, I just worry that the, the demand will just never match the supply, primarily because we'll keep, for example, going to a bank and say, employ more people, and they say, well, we're working optimally at this level. And so the more we engage with the active um, companies in the marketplace, they still might not see any value primarily because maybe their sectors are saturated. And so we really got to, I think, get smarter 
around how we do our economic planning as a function or how we do our education planning as a function of where we're investing for, for our economy. And one of the, 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 the points Rob made again was around, you know, the digital divide. And, and in South Africa, we, we find ourselves in a space where the, uh, the economy itself is subject to the big global moves. And so the digital intensity is, is accelerating. And of course, it's been accelerated faster by COVID, but the underlying infrastructure is not moving as fast. And as a result, then the digital divide is going to accelerate. And, and um, we, we, you know, you look at number of research pieces that are out there that shows, for example, that people are still not using online web searches as the largest form of job search. So people still go to companies and knock on their doors um, uh, to, to, to get opportunity or to, to have a sense of the opportunity. And as a result, transport becomes the largest contributor cost friction for people in their job search process. And so, and so what it does eventually is that as your economy gets poorer, as we've seen in South Africa with our per capita income declining over time, and inequality increasing and poverty incidents increasing, you just get more discouraged job seekers in the marketplace and a bulge, in essence, um, growing from a social risk point of view. And I think those are some of the things that are certainly uh, key in, in terms of how we think about um, you know, the, uh, removing the frictions even for the current um, labor force as it stands to still remain um, energized and, and, and have uh, the right propensity at least to have an opportunity to come into, into the labor market. However, one of the interesting things and I thought um, to again augment um, the insights that we received from, from uh, you know, uh, Rob is what's the digital context that we're living in in South Africa um, so that we can contextualize all of the conversations around digital learning and all of, the, all of that stuff and the value thereof. So one, there's, we can look at this from an institutional and a regulatory pillar. And my key, key, key bugbear there is the regulatory, infra, uh, is, is, is the qualifications framework. That qualifications framework is outdated as it stands and it has been outdated even before we saw the level of digital intensity that we see now. And, and the, you know, all of the surveys that have you know, been done in the marketplace to have a sense of you know, where are, 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 the, are, are the challenges with, the, with respect to the, uh, uh, the framework, the issues of relevance, the issues of, of dynamism of that regulatory framework. And as a result, as we are bringing more online learning um, you know, a lot of those courses aren't recognized by the qualifications framework and therefore companies, for example, don't get the right kind of incentives and so they just don't do it. Um, and, and so it, it means that there's a lot of investments that's left on the table where companies would have otherwise invested. And that doesn't need government to throw any money at it besides adjusting the legislative framework that informs qualifications. And so that's um, one of the, 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 the legislative and institutional drawbacks that we see in the structure of our economy. Spectrum is another one, and it's a really interesting one. And I, I had some uh, very uh, colorful conversations around Spectrum. The challenge with South African economy in general is that it's oligop oligopolistic in structure and it lends itself then broadly to anti-competitive behavior. And this is why we've got market, um, we've got findings of, of market dominance from the Competition Commission um, on the back of the incumbent telecommunications firms that were in the economic marketplace. And this is why they're being pressured to reduce data costs. Um, and therefore, what does it mean to create a competitive environment in that marketplace but also in a way that doesn't hurt the outcomes of the entire country because telecoms is a network industry. And so it's an enabler for other portions of the economy to function. And there's the spectrum band, um, I think between 800 megawatts and 2.3 thousand megawatts um, uh, that, that is, is where a lot of the people um, consume, I'd, I'd say data. 
um, and that's got the radio, the TV um, uh, frequencies as well. And so that's the space where we, may, we need to make sure that all of the choices we're making on spectrum today will inform an inclusive economy in terms of a competition point of view. And that in and of itself becomes beneficial for outcomes um, of, 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 of data price and data costs in the economy. And so that's one of the things that we need to think about. And so by the time we're having conversations about 5G and spectrum auction, the challenge with spectrum auction is that the, the one with the largest balance sheet wins in the bid, right, in an auction. And, and, and that doesn't, that, that in and of itself lends itself then to, to um, building in um, a price component there because if it costs me X amount to bid for a number of, you know, I, 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 if I can explain this thing of spectrum simply, it's around having a freeway and trying to add more lanes in the freeway. And, and, and that removes the traffic um, uh, pressure that you find. And so if it costs more for me to, to get those, those lanes and then I've got to pr price it in in my payback and that then informs the cost of data and all of those things. And so um, spectrum auction of itself can be very dangerous in terms of what we want to achieve, uh, particularly for 5G in terms of uh, uh, accessibility of data in South Africa. And so there is that conversation that certainly becomes quite important from a regulatory point of view to consider how the access from a price point of view um, of data becomes uh, critical in the way in which we plan for the economy going forward. The other question then is around, uh, you know, the household itself, you know, the, and we call it the digitalization, the personal digitalization pillar, is that do we understand how people actually interact with digital devices? Because we can talk um, ad nauseum around le uh, online learning, et cetera, but if people only want to use digital devices for WhatsApp, there's something that you really need to understand first before you build in online learning as a, a new learning technique or a new learning approach. And, and, and right now, I think there's not enough of a concerted effort to think around one, having a clearer view of where we are, what's the state of the digital engagement of the household, and then how do we migrate them to a point where learning is a natural thing that they do via digital devices so that we're planning for a digitally intensifying economy where online learning actually becomes a thing. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, the, again, the digitization of production, right? And so as much as we talk around a digitally intensifying economy, how many of our systems and our approaches in the marketplace are, are lending themselves to digital transformation? How many organizations um, still go, uh, insist on, of, for example, of going to SARS to do their tax returns when they can do it online? I'm just using that as a, as a pure, simple example, right? Um, E-filing has been probably one of the lauded successes from a SARS point of view, but still some people um, even without first having any challenges, we'll rather go to, go, go to um, SARS. That increases the carbon footprint from a, a systems thinking point of view. Uh, there's a cost from a transport point of view, and there's a cost from a time point of view, sitting and waiting. So all of these things that build in costs and just into, into the operational uh, design of businesses. And we ought to think around those things and say, what does it mean to help industries, help enterprises, to think differently about also embedding, I think, uh, digital ways of working or digital engagement in the way in which they do their work. All of these things are important because that will then inform the supply side of the market. Because if we are, are bringing up kids um, or, or, or youth or young people in the economy who are you know, engaged digitally and they, they are already um, one step ahead of some of the organizations, the way they're working. If we don't get those organizations ready, those people look like they're just trying to change the way businesses are doing things. They don't plug in quite nicely in the way those organizations work. And so these are some of the things that become critical. Also in then, once Rob has done his uh, wonderful work in preparing um, the young people for job readiness, that the, that the job market itself has got to be ready for them as well. Um, in its own design elements. And then the, 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 the last pillar is, um, 
this idea of 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 e e economy and 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 I don't want to just call it e government, but we are we are starting to see, for example, government taking important steps towards the registration of companies um, on e platforms, and then you can uh, get your uh, you know SARS uh, certification on the same platform, etc. But up until we truly get a a a really strong e government that will enable um, the, an e way of working as a means of doing business, and so um, it's digital being an economic and strategic thrust that will also enable us to migrate as an economy and therefore also carry the, 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 the people who are coming into the economy well with us. And, and so I think we certainly are still lagging um, in terms of the, that context. And that's why uh, e-commerce in South Africa, um, as much as you could have, you know, uh, however many billion online transactions, most of those online transactions were about buying airtime and electricity and not clothes. Um, and so how, you know, what was the creating that, that resistance from um, the economy transitioning towards an e-commerce based economy? And it's because of the frictions that were currently in place and, and delivery mechanisms and also the warehousing structures and all of those things. And so the point I'm making is that the economic context cannot be devoid with our skills plan. And so if we don't have systems thinking in how we think around um, the market itself, the structure of the market that will absorb the people we're creating for that particular market, the many things that we're gonna continue missing. And so it's really around um, both at an enterprise level as well as a public sector level to ensure that we have the right kind of systems thinking um, in our own contextualization of what labor participation looks like to ensure then that we are participating at the right level. And I think that's certainly, I think for me, an important uh, context of, or, um, to, to augment, I think, the, the valuable insights that we certainly got from Rob. Thanks. Great, Rob. I don't know if you have any comments there, but I certainly want to ask Safiso something. Safiso, there, there hasn't been much focus on arts and culture, and there hasn't been much talk on it. And the reason I raise it is in the early 90s, South Korea decided to make one hell of an investment in arts and culture. And I think they increased their budget from 2% to 10%. And that resulted in the K pop movement. And now it's one of the biggest industries in South Korea, and it's, 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 as you know, it's gone global. So if you can comment on that in the South African context, why, is, why, why are we not looking in that direction? Oh, that's a brilliant question, Maurice. Um, and Canada did the same thing, and Ireland did the same thing. Um, and France actually also did the same thing, and that's why we've got the Cairns, um, Film Awards, and, and, and Toronto, um, uh, creative uh, industry burgeoning there. And Ireland actually, um, I think, um, quite far back was, uh, I think about nine, 1903, um, the king then said, uh, you know, artists are really poor, we must never tax them. And, and the tax structure for uh, creative industry participants still remains quite accommodative, even in today's context. And what we saw in the Copyright Amendment Bill is one of the things that uh, I think are certainly uh, have been a friction in the context of the South African economy in terms of uh, using the legislative framework to be more um, celebrating of, of creative um, industry participants. Um, and as a result, we've, we've still got um, that that's gone back to the presidency. They can't sign that because there were many things um, that while in the spirit of how they were written in how it would manifest in real life, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be beneficial for a lot of uh, the creative industry people. I'll make an example from a writing point of view, right? In Africa, um, close to 86% of the literary work that's there is academic literary work. And therefore, um, when the, the exclusions of, of, of um, exclusion 12, I think, in, in, the, in the amendment bill that talks to the rights of use um, and that you could pretty much plagiarize up to 500 words without any account. It means that, you know, it will discourage a lot of academic writing in the, in the African context. And that would be catastrophic for that particular industry. 
Um, and so the question around um, the creative industry, and also quite interestingly, the, that's the industry one that's probably the least susceptible to a, digital, a digitally intensifying economic marketplace. Um, I think 86% of the jobs there uh, are not immediately at risk um, from a 4IR point of view, uh, as well as the fact that it's one of the sectors that lends itself to youth, broad-based youth employment. And so two thirds of the people who are employed in the sector are below the age of 34. And so these are some of the things that I think um, support the question that you're asking, Maurice, around have we um, taken for granted the value that the creative industry will, would bring, I think, to the economic structure in South Africa? And my quick answer there is absolutely yes. Um, we've uh, engaged extensively with the minister um, in them trying to reposition, I think, the challenge with the creative industry has really always been looked at as the as the fluffy and 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 kind of um, non-impact sector. Um, and yet, when we look at, for example, the value that sport can bring, I make the example of 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 the World Cup rugby World Cup that we had in 1996. In a one month period, we had a doubling of tourists um, from New Zealand and Australia. And the impact that will have on tourism on, on, on the rest of the hospitality sector, for example, is huge. And so once you have systems thinking around the creative industry and how one concert has multiple effects um, for other pockets of your economy, and then you will start to understand the true value of, of, of the creative industry and how that also um, lends itself to, um, I think, um, a, a global attraction from, uh, from a filming point of view and a whole lot of other things. Um, again, I, I mentioned tourism because it's the easy low hanging fruit in the context of that conversation. So there's certainly a lot more that needs to go into, into that industry as an investment from a systems thinking, because that's the sector that certainly can galvanize uh, a lot of growth and activity in the other subsectors. And, uh, and I'll take it there's also got to be quite a paradigm shift in, in thinking. And I, to, I'm glad you mentioned sport because it's, it's a good illustration where the paradigm shift has not emerged. So you see sports and it's quite good to, uh, it's great to have a son who, who's doing well in rugby and he becomes a sportsman and becomes a, a, a springbok and he does really, really well. Everybody's proud. But now we have eSport and that's where the paradigm shift hasn't shifted. Okay, it's not good for kids to play esport. It's called an addiction. Being addicted to rugby is fine, but not to esport. Esports prize money is bigger than, uh, than, uh, than, than the rugby prize money. So there you go, there's a paradigm shift. Why are we not focusing on making South Africa the esport capital of the world? You know, isn't that the kind of paradigm shift that one is looking for to actually make a, a, a success of, of, of the fourth industrial revolution? No, no, absolutely. And, and, and I think Rob will probably have a better answer for, for this than me. Um, but it's, it's again, the unfortunate part is, is, is continuing to have to sell this reason to believe. And, 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 and that you need to do that much more work first for, for any of the incumbents to believe that this is an area in which we need to invest for it to become a material contributor for the economy. But I think, Rob, um, you've got, a, I think, a better texture of, of, that, of that question. <laughs> um, I don't know why you think that I, I know more about esports than you do. I was going to say, uh, Maurice, my teenage son would absolutely endorse your, um, your belief there. So, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I wanted to respond to just a couple of things. I mean, that, that's what he has said, and I think I violently agree with uh, pretty much everything that he's, um, that he's said. Um, bringing the private sector more into to, um, some of the systems design is critical. To your point around, I think, um, data, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think just by way of example, we, uh, over the, the sort of level one, level two lockdown, we ran a campaign to reach and support six million young people in South Africa off a zero-based Mobi site. Um, we did some fairly basic sort of data diaries to understand what and how much data was kind of costing them. And they were spending anything from like 300 Rand, um, 300 Rand a week up to over a thousand Rand on data. Now, if you're in a household where you're in lockdown and no money is coming in, um, that is absolutely material. 
Um, so just a, just a kind of a data point, just a, a, a data point on data, actually, um, to, to illustrate just how absolutely impactful, um, impactful that, that really is. Um, and absolutely, and your, yes, our lived experience of, of work seekers who would knock on doors and, and pay large portions of their, of, um, on transports to look for work and now, um, shifting seeing that kind of shift into into data as well so and and we you know we we've asked there were a number of surveys that were run during uh during lockdown by the uh, unicef uh, the human sciences research council ran some surveys on on youth and the results are sort of appearing now but sort of the the, the second third biggest issue behind work um and surprisingly is from a concerned perspective for young people is the cost of of data um it's, it's really there. And I really like the point um, that in thinking about online learning, Stevie, so you've actually, there's got to be a, you've, and we've talked about this separately, you've actually got to put the, the learner, the user, the young person at the center of that and understand um, what they need and how they will utilize this. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we, we've, we uh, have an operation in, in Rwanda as well. And, um, um, you know, we, 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 were, we adopted a very lean approach to kind of how we were, were rolling out a program of sort of online support to, to young people. And, um, you know, the, the classic, I think the classic throughput rate on a, a massively open online course is about 2% um, completion rate. Um, and so we were very conscious about kind of that stat that, you know, only 2% or, or, or less than 10% managed to get through to the end of a, an online course. Um, and so introduced um, access to tutors as a means to kind of, to, to keep engagement up. Um, and we're able to kind of raise our throughput rates to about 44%. So there's, there's small things around, and there are absolutely small things around understanding how youth, um, what youth need um, and how they um, consume it. And it's pointless developing, and I'm not, a, I'm not a tech expert by any stretch of the imagination. I can only speak on, on the experience of our own tech deployment a little bit is it's pointless building a very java script rich heavy site um if it's going to consume that data which is you know money on that data which is so critical and so you know if you look at our own um a moby site um it was designed to be as plain as basic as possible and to require very very little input from young people so in fact uh we asked them for three pieces of data, your name, your ID number, and a telephone number. In fact, more because we asked you for two telephone numbers. Um, and then we call you back so that we are carrying the cost of the interaction, not you um, in, that, in that space as one example. And then I think, you know, uh, but that, that all said, that there are some interesting examples of work that has been done in this space. So FUNZI is a, um, a, a program that was run, I think, with Syrian refugees endorsed by the United Nations. Um, to provide very cheap online mobile learning. Um, we've deployed it here uh, in, a, in a small way to provide young people with access to materials around um, understanding the COVID-19 virus. Um, it consumes, I think, less than two megs of data to kind of complete that operation. So there, there is a real paradigm shift, as, as you've said, Sophie, so to, to really thinking about how, how, you deploy, um, how you deploy data and technology. I see there was a question around, so how do we get, how do we, how do we massify moves into the informal economy of young people? And it's a very good, it's a very good question. And it's a, it's a hard question to, to answer. I think we have some emerging ideas. I'm not sure that we believe that we have the answer to that. Um, I think classically, classically entrepreneurship and incubation programs tend to have a, a, a waterfall or a pyramid effect. So, um, take in a huge bunch um, at the top and then filter that out down to the bottom. Um, and I think the one challenge is how, how, do you, how do you flip that and get, or how do you remove that kind of filtering effects um, so that you don't get programs that are, are populated with the, the best of the best, if you like. I think the second, the second learning that we've had from, from some iterations of work in the space is, is you can't just launch an entrepreneurship program and expect that it will be successful. 
um, you've got to actually understand where young people are at. Um, and, I'm, and this is psychosocially where they are at in their kind of communities and what they're grappling with. Um, because if you're asking someone to run a program or, or to, uh, you know, example, for example, sell Fekuk uh, in their community, um, if they don't have the confidence to do that selling or the resilience to keep on selling, there's going to be a fall off. And so, you know, some of our program design has been to actually just spend two weeks just in work that just builds young people's confidence and resilience um, before introducing an element of sales uh, to get them to believe that as one kind of element. The second that I think has been, has been really telling for us is, um, and frighteningly so, is, is a level of basic financial literacy. Um, uh, the basic things of understanding how much money I get in, who I get money for, and what I spend money on. And so our work has been to actually build very simple programs of, of understanding those money flows and what profit looks like um, as critical. And, and in the communities that we've been working with, that isn't something that young people are thinking about in a, um, in a, a, structured, in a structured way. And so, and so this idea of keeping a financial diary, um, of understanding your money flows, um, is kind of another element to it. So, I mean, I just made some, some sort of passing comments of what we understood um, um, as some of the challenges, but, but then we've seen some really good and some really interesting success factors. Um, so, sorry, there's a third challenge. The third challenge is that young people don't see opportunities in the informal opportunities as opportunities. That the formal, and understandably, the formal job market is, um, is an apex um, desirable a desirable job and you can understand that absolutely but we've we've seen young people through informal work actually earn the equivalent if not better than some of those entry-level jobs in places like the retail and hospitality sector um, so you know we've seen um tabang in durban um during lockdown rented a sewing machine and um, is earning three thousand rand a month by sewing masks and and the like we've got um William, who uh, uh, borrowed a collection of bicycles, set up a, uh, effectively set up a Mr. Delivery service delivering Kota uh, and Fetkuk to, and Bunny Chows to his community um, and collecting, um, collecting medicine for old people um, and charging a kind of small fee for these. And so there's, there's, there's creativity and there's opportunity there and there's real opportunity to uh, to build incomes that start to look like uh, the formal sector, formal sector jobs, and in some places can um, can exceed that. I also do want to say that I I don't I'm not advocating that in, the informal sector is an endpoint um, for young people, but it it can be a comma. It can be a place to earn an income without falling into the effects of labour scarring, where you're completely out of the economy, and actually you're building a whole set of skills. Um, that actually potentially can take you into the formal economy, either into a job because you are able to show that you've got resilience by selling something um, and you've got skills in kind of doing that, or actually up a layer of increasing formality of your small informal business into something that looks like, um, that looks like a business. And I'm sure Sophie will have something to say on, on, on just the SME landscape in South Africa. And, and I mean, it's, it's not geared. It's geared in a, you know, the, I, I think, I think, well, we, what's, our, what's our ranking in terms of ease of business? Um, are we 47 or something? Rwanda is number one or number two. We're but 84. 84. Um, but it's, it's that notion of, of, of systematically and structurally we're not designed to, to support um, enterprises like that. All right. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, I see we are out of time. I must mention... No, to, to the panelists and the audience. I asked my son uh, what he'd want to be when he grows up. And he said, either a gamer or a YouTuber. And I said, why? And he said, because you're a YouTuber, Dad. And I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks, audience. Uh, Thank thanks. you very much. Yeah, thanks, Sophisa. Thanks, Ron. We uh, do 
have a uh, on Monday. We've got a great one, so have a look at that. Please join us on Monday. Um, we have webinars every day that you can join at 10 o'clock. Uh, look out for the line out on the COBRA website. That's www.cobra.org.za. Or just drop us an email. Thanks so much. Thanks to the panelists and thanks to the audience.